Hello and welcome back to this video series about complex analysis. Now, as promised, in today's part 20, we will talk about antiderivatives in the complex realm, which are also often called primitives. However, before we start with this, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter, you can do the quizzes and check out the PDF versions of the videos. Okay, then let's start talking about antiderivatives or so-called primitives. Indeed, the definition is exactly the same as in real analysis, but here we use the complex derivative. Therefore I would say, let's quickly fix the definition here for the rest of the video. So as usual, we take an open set u in the complex plane and a function f defined on u. And now an antiderivative for this function f should be a function capital F also defined on the set u. In fact, this is then a holomorphic function because it should be complex differentiable everywhere. We have this because what we want is that capital F prime, the complex derivative, is exactly the function f again. And then in this case we call capital F a primitive or an antiderivative of f. Now again, the important thing I really want to emphasize here is that we are talking about complex derivatives. And we already know these are much more restrictive than the derivatives in real analysis. Still, also here, we get the important fact that antiderivatives can be used to calculate integrals. So I would say, this is something we should immediately put into a fact you can remember. So as before, we start with the same assumptions, so we have a function f, and now we assume that this function f has an antiderivative capital F. Of course, it's not hard to see, if we have one antiderivative, we have infinitely many. This is simply because constants will vanish after differentiation. However, for our fact here, you can just fix any antiderivative capital F. And then it helps us calculating the complex contour integral of f. Here please recall, for the definition of this complex integral, we need a parameterized curve gamma with range in u. And then you know, the result of this integral is just a complex number. However, now the claim here is, this complex number can be calculated with the antiderivative. For this, maybe let's quickly visualize the curve gamma in the complex plane. There we can say, we have a starting point gamma of a, and an endpoint gamma of b. Of course, the curve could do a lot of things in between, but it starts at one point and it ends at one point, that's for sure. And exactly at these points we can evaluate the antiderivative capital F. And now it turns out that the difference between both points is exactly the contour integral. In other words, here you see, if we have an antiderivative, the way between both points does not matter for the integral. So it just matters where we start and where we reach the endpoint. Of course, this is a very strong result and you should remember it. However, indeed, this outcome here is not so surprising as we will see in the proof now. Essentially, it already follows from what we have learned in real analysis. Okay, so for the first step here in the proof, let's recall the definition of the complex contour integral. There we know it's simply given by a complex integral on a real interval. This means it's simply a complex linear combination of two ordinary Riemann integrals in R. And this implies that we can use everything we have learned in real analysis about Riemann integrals. And of course, the important fact we want to use here is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Because this one connects integrals with antiderivatives. However, before we apply this, first as a side note, I can ask you what is the derivative of the antiderivative f in composition with gamma. I write d dt for our derivative because then we can use our parameter t. Now, when you see this, then you should know, of course, it's a composition, so we can use the chain rule. And of course, this even holds for complex derivatives. More precisely, it means we have capital F prime of gamma of t, times the inner derivative gamma prime of t. So not hard to see, this is the result when we apply the chain rule. However, now you should see, this is exactly what we have here in the integral, because capital F prime is exactly our lowercase f. 
Hence, what we can do is to rewrite the integral here with the derivative d dt. And exactly at this point, now we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And of course, this works without any problems, because we could split this integral into a real and into an imaginary part. And then we can apply this theorem to the ordinary real Riemann integrals. And then, of course, afterwards, we put both results together again. Hence, what we get is that we have this function here, evaluated at the upper limit b minus the lower limit a. And then, when we put both numbers in, we get exactly what we have stated above. Therefore, now the proof of this important statement is finished. And maybe you immediately see an important implication of this fact here. And as usual, in mathematics we call something like this a corollary. So as before, we assume that we have a function f with an antiderivative. Moreover, now we also assume that the curve gamma in the integral is a closed one. So there, you already know from the last video that the notation we use for the integral is a circle at the integral sign. Now, please recall, closed for a curve means that the endpoint is the same as the starting point. In other words, here in the difference, both parts represent the same number. Therefore, in this case, the result of the integral has to be zero. So you see, this is also an important fact you should remember. A closed integral gives you zero if we have an antiderivative on this domain. Okay, then I would say, let's look at some examples now. So let's start with one where we have an antiderivative. So the domain u should be given as the complex plane without the origin. Because then we can look at the function f of z given by 1 divided by z squared. And there, of course, we know we have an antiderivative capital F. Namely, this one will be minus 1 divided by z. Because the complex derivative of this one is exactly 1 over z squared. And now we can conclude with the corollary above that the complex integral is always zero when the curve gamma is closed. For example, this fact also holds when we go around the origin. So we don't have to calculate the integral at all, because we already know we get out zero because we have an antiderivative. However, at this point, maybe you remember the important example we had in the last video. There, we can consider the same domain, but now with the function 1 over z. Indeed, in the last video, we have calculated what happens when we take the curve as a circle around the origin. More precisely, the result we got was that this integral is equal to 2 pi i. And one possibility to get this curve here was to choose gamma defined on the interval 0 to 2 pi and set to e to the power i t. Okay, but now the important thing to note is that this 2 pi i is not 0. Hence, this allows us to use a contraposition and to conclude that this function here, 1 over z, does not have an antiderivative on this domain. So you see, this function here acts completely different than the similar looking function 1 over z squared. However, at this point you can ask the question, is the logarithm we have defined not an antiderivative of 1 over z? And indeed, it seems a little bit strange, but the answer for the question is yes, the logarithm is an antiderivative of the function 1 over z. But the crucial detail here is that the domain has to be smaller. So maybe you remember from part 13 that we have defined the set d minus pi. This set was given as the whole complex plane without one slit. Namely, the whole real negative axis including 0 was excluded. In fact, for this domain we have defined the principal value of the logarithm function. Now, moreover, in the same way as we have done it in real analysis, we can show that the derivative of the logarithm function is 1 over z. So this is not hard to show, and indeed it shows us that the logarithm is an antiderivative of 1 over z. However, please note, now the domain is smaller than the one before. In particular, such a curve as this one is not possible anymore. In other words, we cannot enclose 0 with the curve. Still, for all closed curves like this one, we get the same result as before, namely that the contour integral is equal to zero. 
In summary, we can say for isolated singularities, like zero in this case, it can make a difference if we enclose the singularity with the curve. Indeed, for 1 over z, it makes a difference of 2 pi i. However, for 1 over z squared as before, it does not make any difference. Therefore, you can immediately remember 1 over z plays a special role in calculating integrals. And I would say, let's fill in the details with the next video. Therefore, I would say, let's meet there and have a nice day. Bye.